Tout l'arbre Non Ok, good. Okay, so as I mentioned this morning, afternoon will be app engine uh, focused. We have uh, three great talks. <laughs> the first one, I'll be talking to you about uh, why app engine should be the preferred choice for any of your startup projects. Uh, going to be a bit of an introduction, then <coughs> practices. Then we have a uh, Yacho that will be talking about his perspective as well around the same, uh, you know, same problematic pretty much. And the third talk the afternoon will be. Uh, Raphael, he will be back soon uh, about his Ninja framework. Um, App Engine provides some, you know, not a framework with the platform, but if you want to be at the higher level and, and use a, uh, you know, something a bit different than when the low level access of App Engine, you could uh, consider Ninja for that. Uh, we end the day here. If all the speakers are still around, we we'll take questions and, uh, you know, bounce the question around and get different perspectives to any problem you may have uh, or, you know, larger. Issues may have concerning cloud uh, as a company, the enterprise, etc. Like Alrighty. Let's wait for that to load. Network is a bit slow. Or the Chromebook Ancient Edition may be slow as well. Okay. Uh, original CR48 from uh, the pre Chromebook era. Um, all right, so just quick intro before I start. I'm Jérôme Mouton. Uh, if you've been in the GDG event, you probably know me already. Uh, one of the colleagues of the GDG uh, uh, Berlin, the general one. Uh, as a reminder, we have three DDG in Berlin. We have one for the Android uh, developers, one for the Go developer, and uh, this, you know, other ones that we are meeting with Stefan about the general one. Um, when I'm not doing stuff with the community, I'm also the CTO and co-founder at Stack Engage. Uh, we are a small company, and we launched uh, in uh, mid-2009 on App Engine when it was still a very early uh, preview product. So we get a lot of uh, experience, good and bad, from uh, all these days. And, uh, I can just say, as a starting point, that we are very happy with uh, App Engine, so that's why I'm having this talk right now to convince any of you just starting something today uh, to strongly consider this platform. Um, we'll talk about some quick history about how to host application, uh, talk about the platform, App Engine platform itself, what does it offer. We'll uh, then jump in more basic practices so that we have learned at Snap Engage about you know, uh, what you should do when you use App Engine. That could be a different paradigm from what you've been doing so far uh, using a special hosting platform. We'll finish with some uh, quick myth busting. Uh, I'll just, you know, before you ask the questions and telling me, yeah, it looks good, but you know, what about that? I try to, to uh, preemptively answer your questions. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's start right away. So, hosting web applications, something that some of you have been doing for many years. Uh, in the past, long time ago, uh, we had to go in a colocation, put our server there, and do a lot of work before you could deploy anything. Uh, even before thinking about the code, just to think about the hardware, the board, and the nuts, and everything. Stuff got a lot much easier when uh, uh, the hosting company started renting to you guys uh, virtual machines. So all the hardware was abstracted. You were just saying, I need 10 machines, 20 machines, 200 machines, uh, which are virtualized. So you can start them on demand, you can shut them down, um, and you can clone them with you know, good facilities. But they are still machines. So when you want to scale up an application, when you have users uh, hitting your app concurrently and one server is insufficient, it was still your job to do this scaling. So I'll spend with the next two, three, four minutes uh, focusing on, on the scalability of an application. Why is that difficult? So I can take a small example. You want to, to start a new, uh, uh, bike sharing application for Berlin. Uh, you have this great idea, you know, there's a market uh, and you want to build the app. At first, when you develop something with your friend, you're maybe in the hackathon tomorrow, it's easy, right? You just get a small virtual machine, uh, you know, put on there a database, most likely, uh, you know, and a web server, you know, put your script, uh, script language of choice, maybe a PHP or something like that, and 
just being you and your friend doing some hacking, no problem. This machine will kill you just fine. And then you want to open up, maybe tomorrow night, uh, open up to the, to the circle of friends, not too many people, just to get some feedback. And this small machine maybe start to crawl, it's not, not performing well enough. With a virtual environment, it's pretty easy. You just tell you know, your, your hosting company, let's restart the same image on a larger machine. And the people that turn away, you get the same code running on the larger machine. And you can do that several times, you know, to, to ramp up with the alpha, the beta phase of your application. But soon enough, you'll reach a wall, because once you are the largest machine available at this hosting company, you cannot just move up you know, with the horizontal scaling. So, so that's where you have to start doing some work. Typically, uh, the lazy developer will just put a web server. And nothing wrong, we're all lazy developers, that's a good thing. Uh, but you put your web server on one machine, you put a database on the other machine, you gain one more step in scalability here, so that you can you know, have performance split uh, across. But soon enough, you have to introduce the load balancer, which is a you know, piece of hardware, sometimes virtualized, that is going to send the inbound traffic from the users to different machines. Problem at this point, there's many different load balancing strategies, um, and if you didn't think about that before, your application is likely to be session, for example, to manage user, <coughs> and the load balancer may end up dispatching the same request from the same user to two different machines. We do not have the session, and then the application breaks. So there's a lot of you know, difficulties at this point because you may have architecture your application in a way which is not scalable horizontally. And if you think that's complicated on the side I had before, you know, now you know, that's pretty quickly you will end up with something like that, with two levels of web serving, two levels of database. And, and the problem there is not only you have to design that, you have to, you know, to set up the system, create some scripts to add more machines, to remove them, but you are also in charge of testing this infrastructure. So what happens if this machine in the middle here dies? You know, what about this, you know, this data, data store here? Uh, and it's your responsibility to, to you know, envision what will happen, what are the possible failures that could happen, network power and these things, and make sure that your infrastructure is resilient to that. Uh, so that is extremely complex. You know, if your hackathon project becomes a real application, soon enough you are going to spend a lot of time dealing with that. So that's the main problematic that App Engine you know, resolves. You won't have to think about all these problems if you use App Engine. Um, so let's now forget all of this and talk about App Engine, okay? First, is it understood and agreed that scaling is hard? Yeah, okay, good. So we can talk. Um, I'll skip that because this morning Jens talked about the yeah, different thing. So, App Engine, what did you get? When you install the SDK in your machine to start building application, you, yeah, you download a, a zip file and start using uh, and you probably have picked first you know, which language you want to use. As of today, you have four languages to choose from, Python, Java, pa uh, Go, or, or PHP, sorry, PHP being the new, new one. Uh, so you get the SDK, you will get some virtualized hardware for you to push your uh, your application once you're ready. Um, there is free quotas as well, you know, Google is pretty generous with that. Without putting any credit card, you can already push your application to the cloud. So, nice things to know. Networking, we've talked several times about that. Uh, it's a huge plus. Uh, Again, yeah, mentioned it, and uh, it's all right. Google has probably the best network on the planet. Uh, if you host your application on App Engine, you'll be leveraging this network, meaning, if you have customers here in Germany and your application is in the US, uh, it won't be any latency that is visible to them. Most likely, if you're a German startup, you probably pick the, the European hosting uh, option, you know, for, for maybe some, some reason. But same thing, if you have customers in Singapore and the US, the latency will be as small as can be because the user will not travel on the public internet to get your app. They will enter the net Google network at the closest point to where they are and then they travel as a light, or the speed of light from this access point to where your app is hosted. Plus several other stuff we've seen a few minutes about uh, making stuff as fast as can be. Um, you know, operating system, you get that for free, of course. So the runtime we mentioned briefly uh, for to choose from. Let me mention something here. Um, if you are starting something new today, uh, and you, you know several of these languages already, which one should you pick? Um, 
that's a question I get several, uh, several times from developers. It's good to know that Python has been the one, the longest there. You know, the US, back in 2008, uh, they made Python only available on App Engine. They added Java in 2009. Go is the most, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, the recent one, PHP is uh, you know, the one they released this year. Uh, so my suggestion to you, if you are equally familiar with those, these first two are where has the most support. It's, uh, it's fully supported, there is a SLN and everything. Go being a kind of a new thing, it's great. You know, there's a lot of, of good stuff with Go, but it's kind of still experimental. PHP, now everybody can use it, but why would you use PHP, right? Is there, <laughs> what? Um, that, that, that is a lot of projects to keep in mind. They didn't implement the full App Engine which feature on PHP. For example, we talk about the data storage. Uh, with PHP, you can only use the MySQL, the, the Cloud SQL version of, of uh, you don't have the scalable big table data store. From what I've seen. So it, to me, it's a strong limitation. Um, just going back to there, for performance, Python is an interpreted language. Java is compiled to bytecode, and Go is native, uh, you know, assembly compiled. So performance-wise, you will see better performance with Go than with Java than with Python. Um, uh, the thing people are saying, again, I didn't try benchmarking, but there's probably a 10x between Python and Go, uh, most likely a 2x between Go and Java. Yeah. So it's something to consider. If you are as familiar, you know, as comfortable with all languages, yeah, going in this space, and you know, I think, uh, as uh, <laughs> Yachol probably said, this space is pretty good. <laughs> um, but okay, I'm probably gazed a little bit in this area. You also get, you know, this uh, app serving, but also the static serving. So when you deploy your application that you develop in your local SDK, when you push it to the cloud, Google will uh, kind of dispatch uh, two types of files in different areas. The static content will be sent to the CDNs for static serving, where the dynamic content will be handled by the app servers. You don't have to define stuff. You could force through some keyword and definition, but you don't have to. The system is supposed to do that for you. You get a very large bunch of services uh, to make you efficient writing your code. You won't have to redevelop all the common things, like you know, we talk about memcache, we talk about task queues, we talk about data stores. It's not just a runtime, and you have to bring in all your libraries. You already have a lot of stuff there. Uh, and yeah, maybe it's obvious, but um, this application platform is uh, full tolerant. You know, if uh, there is a meteor, meteor that, that crash and curse where the data center uh, running your app is, is, you know, of course this would be wiped out. But there is a data center somewhere that is ready to take over. Uh, so. You don't can sleep well at night, you, know, you don't have to worry about this specific event. Okay, I've got two slides following up, which to me are very exciting. Uh, it's not important though, because you shouldn't have to worry about that. It's, but it's just so nice to see all the complicated stuff that happen for you when you deploy to App Engine. Um, when the request arrives from you know, your user trying to book a bike uh, on your new application, um, your, your request will arrive on the App Engine front end server. That's this simple server that will decide what to do with the request. If it's a static file, like an email, PNG for, for some graphics, then we go to the static server. If it's a, a dynamic request, like you know, a RPC trying to find either a bike available at this place, they will uh, check with the app master to see which of the instances is available right now to handle this, uh, this specific request. If there is no instances available because your app is already pretty much loaded, the app master will ask you know, the app server to start a new instance for you. All this automatically, right? you don't have to do anything. Um, if then your request to find is there a bike available uh, needs to get in the data store, in the database, if you want to find the list of the bikes where they are, you will hit the data store, which is a big table stuff on Google, <coughs> probably hit some memcache as well, as well uh, and a lot of other services. But you, you see, all this complicated dispatching of things is done for you. You don't have to write a single line of code. It's, a, it's part of the deployment process. Looking a bit deeper now, so we were only looking at what happened in one data center when the, the request arrived. Now we are stepping back. We have regional uh, view here. On this side is what is close to the user. As I mentioned, Google has data, data center and you know, uh, point of access everywhere in the world. So let's take a, you know, an example. 
the guy here is in Singapore. Your application is in Ireland, let's say, for example. Um, so through the ISP center in Singapore, there is a data center in Singapore. In the data center, they have the Google front end, uh, which is the same front end that Google is using for Google Maps, for Google, Ma for Google Search. This front end, now a lot of stuff, especially if they have an edge cache. So every images or, or every request that you told uh, through the caching header that can be kept for, let's say, 10 minutes, like the bike availability doesn't need to be at the minute, maybe you can cache that. Okay, well, I'm not sure why a guy in Singapore would book a bike in Berlin, but, but yeah, forget about that. But, um, so you have localized very close to the user, a few milliseconds away at the network. This data is available. Uh, and this front end will, will get that directly to the person if it's there. If it's not, that's where the, the pretty fast uh, fiber optic network of Google will route the traffic to the application server where your app is. So yeah, the big picture of this stuff is amazing. If you were to go to your local hosting company here or even to a global, none of them can provide you, or yeah, I don't think any of them can provide you something like that at this scale. All right, um, as I mentioned, I, I'm more Java focused. Um, so I'm, my next slide will talk about what I know best, you know, the Java implementation of App Engine. Um, this, I think the same concept applies very well to Python. Uh, for, for Go, yeah, yeah, Go is a language from Google, so it's, uh, but I think for PHP, they also get the same concept. So the main one is Google provides, of course, uh, their own low-level API, like you know, accessing uh, or sending emails, uh, sending uh, or storing data. Um, all these levels are there at the API level uh, Google defines, but they did a pretty nice job to not just provide that, they also mapped all these services to the standard services or APIs of the language. So if you are a Java developer, you probably have been using JDO or GTA for persistence. You have this API there for your comfort. You don't have to use them. If you want to go to the low level, you can. But if you are porting existing code that you've done in the past, that makes your life a bit easier. I'm sure Nacho will disagree for, for this. And let me go around. For sending email, uh, you probably are using the JVAX mail. Same thing. You have, it's there for you. If you don't want to use this high level stuff because you know you think it's too much uh, overhead, you have the low level API from uh, Google. Okay, so I'm going to dive down now into some of the services that are there for you um, to give you a bit more uh, overview. When you develop an application, you need persistence. You need to store data. You know, my list of bikes, list of users, and try to see what stuff are. Um, typically, you know, with a you know traditional stuff to go with MySQL for that. Here on App Engine, you are using the big table, you know, the the very large large scale non SQL database of Google. Um, the way to say it, you know, if you're not familiar with NoSQL, it's more a sorted array kind of. You know, it's a you have a key. And then you have you know, your data, uh, like a, a JSON view of your data, if you, if you wish. Um, it's, it's, uh, the good thing about it is it can scale to any size because it's uh, replicated on many machines and it's even uh, separated on the machine. The problem is, performance-wise, it, it's not optimized for you to do a lot of concurrency, write on different, different entities and things because, again, based on the scale where you know, stuff is segmented, you cannot do the same stuff that you could do on one single small server you had under your desk. It's a, you have more problematic. So it's very important for most new people I've been talking to who move from a traditional hosting to App Engine, to a different platform. I think I always suggest read the few uh, articles that Google ex uh, put together to explain the concept, you know, uh, what the life cycle of a, of a ride to the data store to, for you to understand exactly what is going to happen so that you can architecture your code to do the right decision there. Um, good thing is, in the early days of App Engine, um, the data store was not what it was today. Uh, it was it was what they called master slave. Uh, so you had replication, but you had only one master lab at one time. And when they were doing maintenance, it was about once a month, once every two months, they had to put your, your application read only, which was super painful. If you hear people telling you, don't use App Engine because you know, the maintenance is very painful, what, what they're telling you about is what used to happen a long time ago. It's no longer the case now. 
with a new uh, Arabic Asian data store, which has been live for two years, maybe three years now. Um, no, it's, you have complete replication in real time. If the data center to which you are connected is in maintenance, or if it's in downtime because they lose power, the replicas in the other data center are ready to take over. So even if latency is increasing on the, on the request, that will switch you on the fly to the other data center. So it's, it's very robust. You can try that. Um, okay, let's skip everything here. Task queue. So most applications uh, need to do some some processing which is not uh, online live when it happens, like sending an email, for example. You're, you have a new user that signs up, create a new account on your platform. You want to send the welcome email and send instruction. If you do that in the same time you are serving uh, the user web page, it's going to be slow. Right? You press send email and then you, know, you have a little spinning wheel in Ajax while you're sending the email. It's not a good experience. So typically, a replication, we have to use task queues to do stuff which needs to be done, but not right away. So with App Engine, you have a very nice task queue system. It's just you map a, a, a URL, in fact, to, to a, a service, and you tell the, in one API call, you tell the system, call this URL in that much time with this payload. And App Engine will retry uh, calling this URL if your RPC is failing, if your service is saying you know, something won't happen, it will handle the retrying as well making sure that you succeed. So very simple, very high level. Uh, um, yeah, and we'll talk about this other second bullet a bit later. Metcache. Um, so I mentioned you have a very, uh, very large scale data store, uh, which uh, lets you process data. It's great because you have no limitation. You can have a data set growing to infinity. Uh, at Google scale, infinity is super large. Um, and yeah, if they can store everything, all the Gmail in the world, you know, they can store the data. That's, that's pretty much a given. Um, <coughs> the problem with that is, as I mentioned, compared to data uh, database which would be under your desk or in a rack in a single machine, the performance is much lower uh, because yeah, it's uh, distributed. A request will span across several servers and everything. So to make stuff fast, uh, even even for people using App Engine today, the standard is you use a main cache system. Memcache is a way to store in memory some key value pairs, uh, and it's typically super fast. It's about 10x faster to, to find something in memcache in the data store, and to write is also you know, probably five times faster as well. The good stuff with App Engine is you don't have to rent an instance of memcache. You get memcache shared service for free. Um, so your free quota has it, your paid application has it as well. The, the shared memcache, you get about 100 megabytes of memcache. It's not guaranteed, of course. If you have a, another application in the same cluster that is using a lot of memcache, performance may, uh, may degrade a little bit. You may have a bit more peer pressure of expiration. But yeah, that's typically what you could uh, expect. It's quite a lot of data already. And, and so it's for you to design your, um, yeah, your, your, not architecture, but your strategy for what should you put in memcache. Like, for example, the list of your bags uh, that a lot of people are going to query, it's probably a good thing to put there because when you want to read is this bag available, it's much faster for you to put it to main cache first. If the main cache has expired because of pressure or because this key has been unused for a long time, then you go to the data store to get the data. But having this layer of first trying for very cheap, you know, free is very cheap. To, to go to, uh, to main cache and then if it's not there going to the data store, improve speed and improve also um, performance. I'm saying another way also to, to use main cache is to, um, when, you interface, when, sorry, when you interface with another uh, system, like yeah, for the bike, what would it be? Uh, I don't know, it's a, yeah, let, let's say you have a bike rental store which is interfacing with your stuff and they may use Salesforce, I don't know, to, to track their customers. So yeah, let's go by. Uh, so you are going to do some RPC between your App Engine app and Salesforce to create leads or, or, or bring back customer data. Doing an RPC to an external supporting system, it's time, <coughs> time uh, consuming. Right? You have to do a several API for authentication, then to get data and everything. It's probably a good idea if you are going to do this a lot during the transaction of one user to keep in the main cache the answer you get from, from Salesforce, for example. So it's not 
forcing you to use that for the data store. It's a general purpose mail cache coming for free with that engine. Uh, yeah, let me add something here. We have now as well dedicated mail cache. If the shared mail cache for free is at the point where you're not creating it for your app, you can tell Google, I would like to have X number of gigabytes of mail cache uh, such that I can do that many uh, 10,000 uh, operations per second. Um, so the price is pretty aggressive as well. Per month, you pay $80 per gigabyte and per 10,000 operations per second. So, not expensive. But again, typically when you start, and for quite some time, the, the shipment cash could be doing stuff good for you. Yeah. Something I have to plug here, uh, it's not really App Engine, but GUIT, uh, it's a for Java developers, it's a, an awesome, awesome framework is not getting as much coverage anymore, but writing JavaScript is hard. You know, it's, um, as soon as you have a large application, doing JavaScript by hand without a framework is difficult. So there are many frameworks available. With, uh, um, kind of uh, is targeted to Java developers because you write your front-end code in Java. So the same language as used for the back-end, use that for front-end as well. And the GWT compiler will create JavaScript for you um, for the different target platforms. So they will build one bundle of JavaScript for Internet Explorer 10, one for Internet Explorer 9, one for Chrome, one for Firefox, one for Opera. So you end up with very compact um, JavaScript runtime with optimization in size and performance um, and without you having to think about that. The other big advantage is since you write it in Java, you debug the JavaScript in Java as well. So it's, to me, it's a super nice thing. So why is that on my slide about App Engine? The reason is when you install the App Engine SDK for <coughs> Java, you know, it is there, you know, your demo application can also include the small grid application there. And doing RPC between your front-end code, the cross-compiled JavaScript from Java, and the back-end in Java, the RPC are, are there in super, super simple thing to do. Uh, no API to define pretty much, it's a, yeah, just a sublet and, and then the, yeah, you have a good guideline to do that efficiently. Okay, let's go quick. Uh, yeah, return communication. Uh, this topic came up this morning when we had uh, uh, Steve talking about uh, the, you know, the cloud the real time stuff. Um, App Engine provides two different channels for real time communication. The first one is the channel API. That's a way to do some push notification to JavaScript. Uh, the technologies they use here rely on the Google Talk uh, infrastructure. It's great, it's easy, uh, it's not too expensive. Uh, the problem is there is no guarantee of delivery. So if it's just to post news in one application or to notify users of non-critical events, that's great. If you want to have guarantee that when you push something, the user gets it, uh, it's not sufficient. It, I mean, it, it won't provide you the, the framework for that. You could you know, implement a, a layer on top of it, but that seems to be overkill. Another great step for real time, um, it's a XMPP. So on App Engine, you have a way to send XMPP messages just by calling an API. And you can also receive XMPP messages by mapping um, servlets or, you know, or a service on Python or to the XMPP inbound uh, URL. So super simple for you to do. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I didn't specify that's a Jabber, uh, Jabber protocol. That's uh, what what used to is not no longer that much used. But what we used to have for uh, instant messaging, mm -hmm. most instant messaging platform were kind of XMPP compliant. So it was a very nice way to interact with users, not by email, but through uh, you know push messaging going to Google Talk, for example. Now the sad part is uh, Hangout is not XMPP compliant, so we're losing this bridge. But, uh, that's a different story. Um, so in there, I've seen uh, users uh, using XMPP for something else is to talk to mobile. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, doing polling for mobile isn't great. But XMPP is extremely power efficient. So several people I know are, are using XMPP to do the, the communication to the back end and the application and that engine. All right, I won't go to more services, just to list a few. Google keep adding some stuff. They are investing heavily in the cloud platform. Um, something just to kind of uh, counteract some people telling you that stuff don't work on App Engine. In the past, we, not, we didn't have SSL on our own domain. So you had SSL or HTTPS support for subdomain of the appspot.com uh, 
Google domain, but not for your own domain. Now it's there, it's super well done. Uh, there are two options, the one option is in the virtual IP. So they let you, um, you know, map uh, the C name of your app to a virtual, virtual name of, of Google. And it gives you the same, uh, you know, same global reach of your application from the local access point on SSL as well. So it's, uh, yeah. There's a little bit of overhead for negotiation of the certificate, of course, but that's still super well done. Uh, Cloud SQL, we mentioned it, that's uh, available to um, <coughs> any uh, App Engine uh, runtime. It seems to be the only one they have for PHP for now, which kind of makes sense because PHP in the LAMP stack, they have MySQL. But the way, uh, you know, the, the way we need to see the Cloud SQL is it's a non-scalable database, right? So you decide, I want to have this machine size, uh, and if this machine is credit for you, if, if it's becoming too slow, then you have to you know, migrate your data, maybe on two different machines and start splitting stuff. So it's there, uh, it can be useful in some cases. I don't think I would like to put my application on this one. Um, cloud storage, mentioned by Ian this morning, uh, and even demoed, uh, is you know, the answer to AWS S, uh, yeah, S3, right? No, EC2, sorry. No, no, it's, oh, no cloud storage, my bad. But yeah, that's the S3 answer for, for Google. If you want to store, um, uh, store static content uh, in a you know a large scale, you know, super large file as well. Uh, even the REST API, I think, is exactly the same as uh, S3. So it's easy for people to migrate. Um, yeah, full text search to be correct mentioned this morning as well. And what else is other mention? Um, yeah, two new things that are in uh, preview right now. So the way Google push new features on the cloud platform, they first uh, make that available for people in preview, meaning you're not sure it's going to stay or you may change. So it's always, you know, if you're early stage, if your application is, is not yet heavily used, it's great because you can you can experiment with things. When you have a lot of users, you won't be careful because they may take down, and they did that in the past, you know, something in preview may not reach a maturity level, it may just disappear. Oh. So uh, in preview, which is definitely interesting, is um, it's a, modula, a modularized application. So if you don't use that today, when you deploy your application, you deploy everything. So as your application grows, you know, you have you know, hundreds of megabytes of data, it can take a lot of time to deploy. And also when you have a large team, uh, you have you know, the team working on the stats engine, the team working on the real-time engine, the deploy has to kind of do everything in one time. With modularized application, uh, you can push pieces by pieces, team by team, uh, making you know, the development cycle much much flexible for sure. Um, the last item on my list here, the Compute Engine backends, uh, that's definitely very promising. So you have to keep something in mind. To be able to, to leverage this, this scalability that works for you automatically you know, at the Google scale, you have to, to live within a kind of a, a closed sandbox. You don't get all the native Java uh, uh, function that you know, if you want to do some socket uh, IO, yeah, it won't be possible. So that's necessary for Google to be able to have some uh, some constraint to make the scalability possible. So if you need stuff outside of the sandbox that you provide, you could run you know a Google uh, Compute Engine instance that is also running uh, the uh, the App Engine runtime library on it. Meaning you have all the access of data store, memcache, task queues but you also have a full JVM or a full Python stack. Um, and you can let, in theory, you can let uh, App Engine schedule the, uh, the warming up of the instance, the taking down the instance, based on the load of your application. So this stuff is still very early, but that's very, uh, very promising for sure. It's, I think that's one of the main contention points for developers. When they move from something to App Engine, they realize that some critical pieces uh, they need kind of be run there. L like one of them that maybe is not true anymore, but one of the things is to do some PDF output from an App Engine application. Most Java libraries that uh, we reviewed were using some low level functions which were not uh, allowed on App Engine. So, yeah. so the future is bright. Best practices. Oh, let me go through real quick some, some stuff. So, data store, I mentioned it already. Uh, you need to read carefully documentation to understand the concept uh, before you start, because it's quite different from a MySQL database. The key thing you need to remember is uh, when you get an object by its uh, primary key, because again, it's a, it's a key 
uh, key-based array kind of, of data, right? So if you use this one primary key uh, to search, it's fast and, and inexpensive. If you use other things to search for objects, you know, like other indexes or composite indexes, you pay more and it's uh, not as consistent and as fast. So one more thing. Uh, consistency as well, we have a natural, we'll talk about that, uh, on, the, on this large scale distributed data storage, um, you don't have the immediate consistency you have on one database sitting under your desk. Uh, when you commit an object, if you do a query on this object by some composite index, you may not find the object, or you may find an outdated version of the object. That's because it's distributed and you aren't guaranteed to, to have the stuff right away for you. So there's many, many uh, recipes to work around that, um, but that's something also to well understand before you start. Um, and yeah, property of use, you want to minimize the write, because writing is more expensive than reading, and also you need to use memcache, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, this number of, you know, this write is 10x faster to memcache in the test store, and the read is 5x faster. Okay. So uh, that is, uh, if, you, if you were not today, but five, uh, three years ago, the presentation was pretty sparse. So today there's a lot of good stuff, so you won't be lost when you start diving into that. Something super important. Uh, so to make the scalability uh, possible, uh, Google has to, has to put some constraint on the whitelisting of low-level function, but also on runtime. Because as I mentioned, when a request comes in, they decide do they serve this request on one of the already running instances of your application, or do they start a new one? To make this kind of uh, deterministic, they need to have an idea of how long will a request take as a maximum, so they can do the scheduling of where to send requests based on when the last one started, um, and so on. So to, to be able to do that, they have a constraint. Um, a customer facing request cannot exceed 60 seconds. So that seems, that seems to be pretty reasonable, right? You don't want any way your user to be waiting 60 seconds when they press the button to do something on the website. <laughs> uh, but even more than that, if you have many requests reaching 60 seconds, you have will not perform well because the scheduler expects that you, in fact, try to stay below one second, which for user interaction, I think, is good anyway. Um, if you go over the 60 seconds, your application, uh, the app master will kill your, your, your process. Um, that's one little thing. On Java, multi-threaded uh, uh, application with a thread being killed means the JVM will most likely die as well. So you do not want to let you know App Engine kill one of your processes because that's really pretty bad. So there are many ways. And the next, I think, let's practice talk about that. But, but uh, clearly, if your application uh, has stuff that takes time to do, as mentioned earlier, use the task queue or the cron job. When you are not in a real time customer facing, I think it's okay. you, you are going to, to be able to have more uh, more time for you because is Google will start the process when there is time. It's not happening at the microsecond, but could be a bit later. You have up to 10 minutes to run something when you task queue on the cron job. And if you need to do a large processing of all your entities and maybe millions of objects, uh, you can use a backend, which, uh, which is something you can instantiate. Or, yeah, okay, you use the backend, now the module will take that over, but that's the thing. If you have a way to run very long lived processing, if you need to. Let it move faster. Yeah, exception, uh, I'll just say one quick thing here. For the 60 second delay, uh, before Google start, or Apple Engine start killing your process, you receive a deadline exit exception, and you better catch that and do something. Because if you do not, then they say, they raise the last exception, which kills the process, and that's why the, the ripple effect of, uh, of the JVM dying will happen. Um, but uh, with this exception, you have to return right away. You have a few, maybe 10 milliseconds, and you just do something quick, Typically, what we do, uh, we tell the page to reload. We do a redirect, something like that. Uh, yeah, just in case something went wrong. Uh, so, 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 this one is, yeah, uh, just one more on this one. Um, as I mentioned, you have the platform with many services for, for you to be efficient working your code and not reinventing the wheel. Uh, but you need to be smart as well in, in sourcing your services where it makes sense. Like, uh, I mentioned the, the channel API for written communication. Uh, I mentioned the, the drawback of no guarantee of delivery. Uh, for us, we decided to go with pusher.com because they have a bit more guarantee of, on the service. It's, uh, it's one of the many uh, services doing that. Uh, 
for telephony, you use Twilio, you use my mind for geo mapping, same with for email. So you have to see what service you your need and integrating you know, with Google is super easy. Support, uh, yeah, you have several levels of support, free support on Stack Overflow, you can pay for support with multiple tiers. Uh, yeah, Stack Overflow is free, right? It's a community based support. Now, the good thing is it's free because it's not just counting on other people like you answering questions. Google monitoring uh, Stack Overflow uh, is doing that pretty well. Uh, so you often get answers on Stack Overflow from Google's. Uh, I want to mention developer advocate. We have a few like Yen this morning, it's one of them, uh, and we have several around here. These people are always interested to what you do with App Engine. These are also always interested in making you successful. So if you want introduction to them, let us know. I've got two quick myths busting. Uh, first one, the people often say, if I move to App Engine, I'm stuck on App Engine for life. Uh, because you know, I'm using Google API, Google Platform. It's not the true. Now. There's two projects. Uh, one of them is uh, AppScale, which is a platform as a service like App Engine. And you could decide to deploy your App Engine application to AppScale. They support 99 point something percent of the APIs of App Engine. So it's very likely that something you design for App Engine will run AppScale with no problem. Another thing, if you want for one client to run your App Engine application in-house on your own rack of servers, now you can do that. Uh, JBoss is a project, KPR, that's something implement 99 point something percent of the API of App Engine, making your, your application runnable on your own servers. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll continue with the other one, the pricing. Uh, people often say it's too expensive or slightly. Yeah. I can tell you, um, we have a road access burning video going to go uh, live on YouTube very soon, explaining more about that. But Pricing is super competitive. Uh, we are on App Engine right now, running a large business on App Engine. And any estimation we can do is if we were somewhere else, we'd be paying more. Uh, so, you know, we are happy with the service and with the price. Quick summary <coughs> before I get kicked away <laughs> scaling on App Engine is magic, it happens for you. Uh, you should definitely uh, try that. Compared to what you used to do before, it's easy. It's failover redundant. You know, you have multiple data centers with your data. Your app server can move from one to the other seamlessly. You don't get the pager ring at night when something bad happens. Google does it for you. You pay for what you use. I didn't say much about that. You know, when the traffic ramps up, Google adds instances to serve the traffic. When the traffic ramps down, uh, they take down instances. And the bill you receive at the end of the month is for the number of hours of instances you use. So it's yeah. And finally, to me, that's a, one of the biggest things. When you have a global customer base uh, with a network that Google provide, you get the best uh, or the lowest latency uh, to your app that you can ever get anywhere else. Okay. So we can skip all this and just take questions. Any questions? Just have to say, this side typically takes an hour and a half, so I have to, to run a bit faster. Okay, there are no questions, as well. Thank you, Jerome, for Thank your you presentation. Here's your applause. So, let's have a little break, and by a second, some minutes will start. We have to go way slower, you know? You stress me at the end for no reason. Sorry, it's 50 minutes. I thought you were 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we have 45 minutes, 50 minutes uh, pause for the next talk. Yeah, yeah. So, please, if you have questions, ask. If not, no, no, you are feel free to make what you want. No, stress me to think of questions later again. We have the fireside chat here with different uh, you know, panelists, so it will be a good time as well to, to get opinion from different people at the same time. And don't forget to make photos from Google.